I myself am heading back to school to start a graduate program and have been navigating so many feelings myself as an older person. I know that being a young person of color returning to life as a student is so much harder. And so we are going to talk today about ways that we can support young people of color who are returning to school through everything that's going on. The unexpectedness of each day's challenges has created a new baseline of uncertainty and has conditioned us to, to expect the unexpected. I can give an example from my own life. As I said, I'm going back to school, got an email the day before my orientation saying, hey, California is at risk of rolling blackouts. We are going remote for the week. Nobody come to campus because we can't afford to, to turn the lights on and turn the air conditioning on. Who knew that that was going to be something that I was going to be navigating this school year? So this is something you know that our young people are navigating as well. And also our caregivers, primary caregivers are navigating, finding out, oh my gosh, school is closed. What do I do? How do I care for my child? Um, we know that the uncertainty and unexpectedness can feel like an unbearable load for both young people and again, those of us who care for them. So today we're gonna to explore some ways to stay grounded and support the students of color in our lives as we are all called to adapt to this rapidly changing world around us. And with that, I am very honored to go ahead and introduce our amazing panelists. First, we have Dr. Ayodola Arigen, who is one of the Steve Funds Consulting Mental Health Experts. Dr. Arigen uh, is um, one of our lead practitioners um, for our youth healing space, which I mentioned earlier. And she completed her undergraduate degree at Harvard, then received two master's degrees, one in biology education at Pace University and one in neuroscience and education at Columbia University prior to medical school at Ross. She was a former tenured high school teacher at the Thomas Jefferson High School campus in East New York, currently serves as an active mentor in her community and is the author of Look at My Eyes, a children's book for individuals with autism spectrum disorder. She's also contributed chapters to the Encyclopedia of Autism and has a passion for interactive books for children and their families. She facilitates a monthly meetup for NYC creatives, The Right Brain Gathering, which provides artists an open communal space for exploration of mental and emotional states. She also curated an interactive art gallery titled Feels, Exploring Emotional Spectrums Through Art in Brooklyn with multimedia artwork presented by New York-based and international artists, which served as a provocative medium for mindfulness practice. She's interested in mindfulness and the utilization of creative and expressive arts as a therapeutic modality in her clinical work. She's also interested in curating and facilitating experiences which welcome the intersectionality of mental health and the arts. She's also a fluent Spanish speaker. Next, we have Trace Roth, who is also joining us from Brooklyn, New York. Trace Sanchez Roth is an educator who teaches English as a new language at Sunset Park School High School in Brooklyn, New York and a fellow at the Hollyhock program at Stanford University. Trace has been teaching in the classroom for seven years and is committed to implementing practices that prioritize student voice and center equity, especially for immigrant students and multilingual learners. They live in Brooklyn with their wife and pets and enjoy making puns and playing basketball in their spare time. Last but certainly not least, we have the amazing Nikki Poindexter Ham joining us from the DC Baltimore area. Nikki Ham has served as a school counselor for over 15 years with successful experience in organizational and intersectional instructional leadership. During her time as a school counselor and school counselor leader, she had a proven track record of success in improving student performance, developing teams, and building bridges between the school, parents, and community leaders. She currently is an assistant professor of counseling in the Department of Counseling at Bowie State University. 
Dr. Ham is also a licensed clinical professional counselor in Maryland. She's dedicated and passionate about helping students and their families to remove the social and emotional barriers to their academic success and to achieve mental health wellness. Dr. Poindexter Ham serves on the advisory board for UNEO, which is a mental health physical and physical health wellness app. Finally, she serves as the president of the Maryland School Counselor Association. So please go ahead and give us um, a warm welcome, maybe with some spirit, you know, spirit fingers or um, this is actually ASL applause. I learned that recently. So ASL applause for our amazing panelists. All right, so a few logistics. I'm gonna go ahead and ask our amazing panelists some questions. We will have time at the end for a Q&A. So that's something that I wanna make sure that y'all know. If you have a question, drop it in the chat. We'll record it and we're gonna do our best to get through all of them um, you know, in as much depth as we can before the end of our event. All right. I'd love to go ahead and just open it up to our panelists as we enter the 2022 to 23 school year. What challenges do you foresee? What, if anything, feels unique about this back to school season, maybe compared with other ones? Um, and I'll open it up to all three of the panelists, whoever wants to jump in first. Well, I'll go first. <laughs> um, I think that probably one of the biggest challenges that I see is for our students to get sent back to this sense of normalcy. And, you know, I, I really struggle with this idea of, you know, get back to normal because they're like, uh, was it so great before? <laughs> and so really uh, helping our families, our students and everything, realizing as we forge ahead that it's going to look different and that's okay. Um, and it's going to feel a little bit shaky and a little bit uncertain, and that's okay. And it's going to be scary sometimes, and that's okay. So to normalize what I always say, to normalize the abnormal in some ways, because this is it, it is still abnormal. So I think that's probably one of the biggest challenges that I think that we're all facing. Yeah, I I definitely agree with you, Dr. Ham, and I think. Um, as a teacher, um, we just had our first day of school in the New York City DOE and there was lots of excitement. And also I think I have to remind myself as a teacher and as I interact with parents that just because we've done sort of one and a half school years in the post COVID era, it's not over. And um, our students are still really, not only readjusting to coming physically into school, but even though a lot of our COVID restrictions are lifted and mostly people aren't wearing masks, it's gonna take a long time, not only to sort of readjust to school and figure out like making time for homework and how to raise your hand in class or do those sort of more like quotidian school things, but also that there is a big social emotional toll that's been taking, taken on our students. So to really have patience and be um, comfortable with the discomfort is another way to, to spin what you were <laughs> just what you were saying. So that's that's kind of, um, I'm definitely on the same page with you about that. I agree as well. I've been seeing a, a lot of my patients coming in um, really destabilized. Um, An adjustment has been definitely profound with a capital A. Um, there's a lot of not, it's now multifactorial what the stresses are. It's not only sociopolitical, it's emotional, geographical, our landscapes are changing. And even per se, there's been challenges reproductively um, and challenges um, with our basic rights. And it's really put young adults in a state where they're questioning what are their rights, which then trickles back to who am I? Um, so a lot of identity disintegration and fragmentation that then leads into significant anxiety. And then we're now in a different setting. Um, more people are face-to-face. -face. And as you mentioned, Trace, the um, COVID restrictions have, be, have been uplifted. So even the nuance of having our faces covered, now we're face-to-face. -face. And people are noticing, I have this anxiety. I have social anxiety. I don't, I don't know my basic 
skills of interacting anymore? How do I say hi? How do I start conversations? And um, even me, I, I struggle with that. I, I initially was in a hybrid setting, but now I'm more in person. And we're really having to get back to the basics. And then there is that question of what is basic, right? What is our, our baseline of um, exchange? So um, just to wrap it up, as you mentioned, Dr. Poindexter, it is, you know, it's okay to be not okay. Um, and having this persistency to normalize things sh should just be mitigated. There should not be any stress to make things normal. And just hopefully we can encourage um, our kids, our students to take it day by day and to also be open to asking questions and um, asking for support. Thank you so much. Now, um, you might have already seen uh, on your Zoom, but we also want to open it up to all of you, to the audience, to hear, um, you know, what you think are some of the biggest stressors that you're, you know, seeing in your, your young people's lives. Um, so if you will please take a second to go ahead and fill out that poll, um, it'll be really helpful to see, you know, which of the um, three uh, kind of stressors that we've listed uh, is the one that you think is the most salient or kind of causing the maybe greatest uh, duress for our young people who are who are going back to school. I'll move on to the next question while folks finish up that poll and we can take a look at it after. So for this next one, um, I would love to actually start off with uh, Dr. A. Um, we've discussed the topic of safety a lot recently, physical safety, emotional, psychological, financial. In our current socio-political climate, there are many aspects of safety that are out of our control. How do you think adults can create safer environments for youth of color? What would you like other caregivers to know from your experience. And Dr. A, I'd love to start with you and then have the other panelists jump in. Sure, um, thank you, Danielle. Uh, it brings me back to thinking of um, a diagram. Um, it's called Maslow's um, Hierarchy of Needs, right? And at the base of the, of the pyramid, we have more physiological needs. So food, air, um, clothing. And then above that is safety, um, having protection, having um, different aspects of security per se. And I think what um, parents or caregivers take for granted is how their young adults, how their children may still look at them as a resource for safety. Um, and with safety comes the need to be predictable, the need to be reliable and consistent and also not to take for granted how presenting authentically to the kids can really make them feel at home, even if they're cross country, right? Um, so how can a parent be a refuge per se to their kids? Um, I think what I've been seeing a lot, um, are a lot of parents coming in saying, I, I don't know what I'm doing. I thought I was doing it right. And you know, my kid's 18, my kid's in college and I, I've just realized how much I, I guess I wasn't a, a good parent, a good enough parent um, to them. And what I have realized and what I've provided as feedback is the knowledge to the parents that, you know, we, we think we have this rigid um, template of how to, to parent. And with that rigidity um, can give us a lot of stress that we're not complying with. It. But I challenge them to understand that there is fluidity with that template, that template can be ever-changing and the parents can present as a circle um, of security to their children where they are home base and their children are going off to, to college or the children are matriculating into freshman year of high school um, that how they, how can they be reliable for their kids to come back and knowing that they'll be able to support them in the best way. Um, I think the what I've noticed that has been more helpful is just having curiosity, um, an authentic curiosity, not something that the kids may feel is not cool, but generally um, having interest in the transitions and what um, the kids are experiencing 
And some questions that um, can be helpful just in general. Um, there's no age limit with asking your kid very simply, how are you doing? Um, now, something that can be more templated is I can imagine how the current times can challenge your feelings of safety. How are you? Um, you can, can say, I, I feel a certain way where you can acknowledge and practice your emotional vocabulary. Um, how are you feeling? How are the times affecting you? Um, what have you been doing for self-care lately? So that's not directly asking, do you feel safe? But you can also, with that question, you can also probe to what extent the kids are taking care of themselves. And also how much do you actually need to provide more support if they don't know um, how to um, implement self-care effectively? Um, asking how can I be of better support uh, is important. And also, you know, Creating a dynamic conversation because it's important to have that bi-directionality. You don't want to do the majority of the talking. You want to be um, grounded and you want to provide, you know, more open-ended questions. Um, you can, you know, even stating, you know, values can change um, with stress and transitions. What are you choosing to prioritize now? And, you know, just giving questions that show interest and also that can be predictable, again, for the kids can make them feel uh, more secure and look at you as a resource uh, metaphorically and uh, figurative, figuratively as a resource um, that's the semblance of home, which can provide them more uh, security. Great, Trace, Nikki, anything that you wanna add on that one? Yeah, I think those are all excellent. Um, and I think that is exactly um, what I would just say. And, and then I would add, I think the biggest piece is the transparency, which Dr. A really spoke to, which is, you know, at the, as age appropriately as possible, but, you know, about safety, you know, if, if your child comes to you with a question or concern, to be as transparent as possible, age appropriately, you know, depending on their age. But as Dr. A said, if you don't, you know, the same with the feelings, but also with if a situation and they're nervous or scared to validate that, those feelings and to say, I, I understand that. Um, and I, I'm nervous and I'm scared. As much as you feel comfortable as a, you know, as a primary caregiver, particularly sometimes primary caregivers of color, sometimes we, I don't want to generalize, but I know in my community, sometimes we can be a little bit of like, but I think it helps because it normalizes it for the children to know it's not just me that, um, and I say it age appropriately because you can share that and then share maybe what, um, as Dr. A was saying, what are those self-care things that you do as you're trying to navigate through some really scary things that you're hearing about? Yeah, I, I think you both are really touching on what I was what I was thinking too. And Dr. A, um, you said two things that really stood out to me, the authentic curiosity and the bi-directionality of that relationship. I know as a teacher and especially a white teacher in a space where I teach nearly 100% students of color that if I'm vulnerable with my students and model the language that I want them to use that I will get that back in the way that feels comfortable for them. Um, something, Some tools that I also like to use in the classroom which I think could probably translate well into the home um, or other spaces is um, like for example today we is, is to give them language for their emotions. Um, and sometimes that language doesn't even have to be words, it could be visual. So today on a, on a survey, we asked students to um, draw the emoji that they most um, identify with. And I know it sounds a little like, okay, boomer, but I think it actually, it actually gives the students um, and the, the youth um, something to like giggle about, but also it really helps them connect. Um, and even some students wanted to write about the emoji rather than draw it. Um, and something a little bit more complex is um, like a feelings chart or an emotions wheel um, to provide them with those tools um, so that even if they don't have the language readily accessible to, to, give, them, to give them words that, that can um, help them express their emotions in more um, complex ways. I love that. I, I first of all want to thank you for giving such concrete examples of what parents or other primary caregivers can, um, you know, really actually utilize. Um, 
but also I want to, you know, acknowledge the levity trace that it sounds like you've been able to bring to these conversations. It can feel like a lot to open up a conversation with a young person about how they might be doing given the state of the world. It's sometimes hard to know where to begin. Um, and if that's not something that you may be done with your young person before, um, having kind of a, an entryway that uh, might be a little bit more familiar to them can really open up that door. So I really love that. For our next question, I would love to start with Nikki. Dr. Poindexter Ham, how do you see race impacting the mental health of students of color presently? It is significant. Um, and I think we all know and have heard many of the things um, in terms of the, the, the impact that race has and systemic racism um, and systematic racism has been uh, an impact on so many different areas, but the area of health uh, and social determinants of health are, are significant because it begins to be for some communities, a significant barrier to accessing healthcare, wellness care, that is your human right. Can I just say that it's our human right to have ourselves, our mental wellness and our physical bodies being cared for by people that we choose to have. But yet barriers because of finances, barriers because of distrust. Um, and we, we know that there's a history of people of color um, not receiving adequate or really quality healthcare. So those are really significant. And then as a result, because of that historical information, it can cause a barrier and where communities say, you know what, that's okay. I'd rather not push into the system and rather will um, do on my own. I think a couple things that we can do as healthcare providers, I know myself as a mental health care provider, is really to pull into the community um, and listen. Uh, you know, different communities may access healthcare differently. Um, it may look different. And so you have to be open to being able to say, you and your community are a content level expert in wellness for your community. Find out who those content level wellness people are. And they may have a degree, they may not, but pull in and begin to see how we can partner um, and beginning to say, how can I pull into the community to get a sense of having community members feel safe feel comfortable to access healthcare, particularly I'm always focused on mental health care. Um, and also I like to, as a, a counselor, is really empowering my primary caregivers of, of color, parents and primary caregivers to say, you already are doing some things. Some things I've learned in my training as a counselor are things that you already are doing and to validate, you love your child, you love your student, you love your young person. That is foundational. That, let's start there. <laughs> and what Dr. A was saying, that, that providing those basic needs at Maslow hierarchy, you already are doing some things there um, and beginning to understand. And so that way there is this connection and you're hopefully the goal is building the trust. But I think that one of the things, I mean, it is one of the things that is for me as a counselor, very disheartening and scary. SAMHSA 2019, that African-Americans are 20% more likely to have serious psychological distress than whites. And suicide is the third lar largest, third leading cause of death of African Americans between 15 to 24, and that was 2019. I, you know, I don't have the most recent, but I can only imagine. And so, when you begin to hear those sort of numbers, and yet students of color, families of color, are less likely to access mental health resources. So there is a significant need. But yet there is not the accessing, accessing the resources. So as communities, particularly, it's really, particularly for me as a mental health provider, is making sure that I am providing and looking at where are the system, the, the places or the things that are creating a blockage to access an opportunity for our families of color. Um, and I typically find those to be around things of really not feeling comfortable looking at the language we're using. Um, you know, looking at the spaces, looking at, you know, is it something that um, is accessible for publicly easily accessible? Is it the healthcare place in a location that is accessible? Are the people, the front desk person, is that welcoming and encouraging? I mean, it's really things of that nature. You know, we have schools everywhere. How are we, why are we, maybe that's an opportunity to access healthcare providing so sources in there in that setting. So it really requires um, people 
in the healthcare, mental health care facilities and spaces to be really open to thinking a variety of different ways and not just our traditional. And I'm hopeful because I'm beginning to see more places um, of that that's happening. And also last but not least, because I can go on and on about this, working at a university, it is making sure that we have better representation. So if anybody's out there in the audience thinking about, oh, maybe I'll be a, you can do it, become a counselor, look into, we need people of color. We need people of variety of different genders, variety of different identities, variety of, to come into the field because representation is so essential. So we need um, your voice there. Thank you so much. Um, before I open it up to our other panelists, I wanted to say two things. One, please, if you haven't already and have a question, drop it in the chat so we can get to it during Q&A. And then also, um, I wanted to reference our poll that we did earlier. Um, we found that there was actually a tie in terms of what the top stressor was uh, for students going uh, back to school. And it was between COVID, monkeypox, and physical health, as well as racial violence and microaggressions. And so that is something that I really want to um, acknowledge. We are talking about youth of color specifically going back to school. And so racial violence, whether that is witnessing racial violence, either in person or via social media, experiencing it themselves, navigating microaggressions that might not seem as overt, but at the end of the day, um, really, really do have an impact. Those are, those are things that um, are really affecting our students of color as they go back to school. Um, so I am going to ask uh, all of you to talk a little bit more about um, kind of what, what thoughts you have for how caregivers can support students of color who experience racial violence, whether that be microaggressions or something more overt, um, how, can, how can caretakers support young people of color, you know, after they come to them and say, hey, I experienced this. And I am getting word that the um, Q&A feature might not be working as we want it to, so I'm going to have our tech person on that while. Um, folks answer that question. Hi, sorry about that. Um, yeah, I think, you know, starting with the baseline um, that both of my um, fellow panelists have discussed, which is really listening and being vulnerable um, with the young person that you're engaging with. Um, I think given our current political climate, those moments of micro or macro aggressions are just sort of skyrocketing, um, unfortunately. And um, something that I personally as an educator like to do in addition to um, just being a really open and listening ear um, is um, provide books for students and stories where um, there are characters that students can relate to, um, especially given um, similar identity sort of axes. Um, there's, there's some really amazing young adult literature that's coming out recently that um, deals a lot with race and with gender and gender identity. Um, I can drop a link in the chat later um, for, for some titles if folks are interested, but um, giving students space not only to talk about themselves, but to know that they're not alone. Um, I know some schools also are doing um, restorative justice um, sort of work, and we're doing it in my school. We're starting a lot of, um, we call them circles, where students have space just to share with each other, um, not only sort of on a surface level of what's on their mind, but to go really deep into the, their current lived experiences and have um, really specific designated space to talk about it. Um, so in a family space that might be around the dinner table, that might be um, on a walk together. Um, it doesn't need to be formal or anything, but I think some sort of um, designated space where, where our young people can really feel heard. Um, and that can, that can be specific or as Dr. A was saying earlier, how's your day? 
I know, I know things are really tough out there. I know going back to school can be really hard. You want to be on your phone all day or playing video games all day or out at the beach with your friends. How can we create space for our young people? And I think that happens by really just asking them questions and giving them stories to, to relate to. I'd like to, you know, chime in. I think, you know, asking, you know, asking your kids or asking the students what they think they need is important um, just to be able to assess what they may be doing on their own. Um, so you don't want to um, be overbearing, but, you know, just thinking about the times, uh, death is something that is, has become more real, has been more concrete and um, how, you know, we deal with death it can be very differently. Um, so I think just providing a cushion to open up that discussion with the components of death, you know, grief and bereavement, uh, secondary to, to violence, secondary to individuals who have died from, um, from COVID and how that also can relate to um, trauma or acute stress. Um, these are hard topics. So how can we provide that cushion? How can we apply some textures? Um, Trace, I like when you mentioned just, you know, the differentiation of approach. Because sometimes talking is, is not enough. Sometimes we don't have the words. Um, how can we explore our senses to communicate how we're feeling, right? What does it look like? What does it sound like? Sometimes with um, my young adults, when you know we have the talking and they have that brain fog, they don't have the words. Um, I give them those options. Of, okay, okay, draw it. Uh, what does it sound like? Um, is there a song that you can relate to? Um, what color? You know, what color is it? Um, if you were to to draw it or draw lines, would it be something convoluted? Would it be a straight line? Giving them options also ease their eases their comfort ability to be able to um, communicate effectively. And again, you know, just providing that, that round table per se, whether it's virtually, um, whether it's over the phone, um, that is reliable so they know, um, even if it's, you know, a, a, a weekly check-in, okay, hey, how about uh, 3 p.m. Um, every day, 3 p.m. once a week um, on Thursdays, you just shoot me a text and let me know how you're doing. I think just giving them multiple aspects to be able to communicate can really assuage the, the conversation and make it more dynamic and give them that vulnerability to feel safe. One last little, um, as we were giving suggestions, I think one of the things that I love to do and I, I can share it out is um, progressive muscle relaxation. And you were just talking about some activities of walking. It really is, it's about creating a space where you're tensing up and then you're slowly relaxing. And what I like to do when I do this with my own children, but also with the people that are in my community that I consider that are near and dear to me. Um, Cause that's the other piece. You'll hear me talk a lot about community. We're all in this together. So whether there is a child that you have that lives in your home, there is probably a child somewhere in your community or young adult that you care about. Um, but when they're feeling anxious, stressed, like I can't fix the world and I'm just so frustrated that tensing up and then that relaxation does so much for your body and for really just creating a space of relaxing your muscles. Um, it can be very uh, therapeutic. So I really, I recommend that as um, a really, to me, a great um, strategy to help deal with when you're physically just tense and angry, that tense and in that relaxation. Thank you all so much. Uh, the Q&A is open. The chat is now enabled. So if folks have questions, you can drop them in there. Um, but I am doing a quick time check um, and want to make sure that uh, we get through all of our questions. One of our questions was going to actually be what are some concrete resources that y'all like to use? Um, you know, what are what are some uh, maybe websites or strategies that really stand out to you? So uh, for our panelists, please continue to reference um, any kind of specific resource that you like, and we will do our best to drop it in the chat. And we will also make sure to include all those resources in our follow-up email to all attendees. So if it's going too fast for y'all, that's okay. We're gonna send it in the email as well. 
Um, okay, we'll do one more. Um, we'll do one more question. Uh, and then I'll double check to see if we have any uh, questions in the Q&A. Uh, but first, you'll now see another poll is up. Please go ahead and take a second attendees to fill that out. We're really curious about what types of mental health resources you find most personally valuable um, so that we can continue this conversation with that in mind. All right, um, I'd love to ask Trace um, a little bit about their experience in school. Um, I know Trace, you kind of mentioned this a little bit earlier, but you're a teacher at a very diverse New York City public high school. Are there other identities or social positions that interact with race that are particularly salient for youth right now? And how do you think we can best address the varied racialized experiences and outcomes among students? Trace would love to hear from you. And again, keeping in mind, I know that you work with students who are new language learners who recently immigrated to the US. And so we'd love to hear kind of what, what you're seeing. Sure, thanks for that question. Um, so as mentioned before, I teach in, in Brooklyn in the Sunset Park neighborhood. Um, we have, I believe at least 20 languages represented in my school. Um, I predominantly work with um, newcomers um, who are Spanish speakers um, from Latin America, um, which as a lot of us might know is a particularly sort of um, tense space to exist in. Um, so um, we're getting a lot of students who uh, have recently immigrated um, and a lot of students who have been in detention centers um, and faced a lot of, um, to say the least, difficult and challenging situations. Um, so I'm seeing a lot of trauma in that way, um, but also a lot of resilience. Um, and uh, I think something that, sorry, Brooklyn noises in the background. Um, <laughs> uh, you also might hear my cat because he's doing his thing. Um, regardless, um, I think, uh, so, so the immigration um, issue, is really, really salient. Um, and, and that obviously connects directly to race. Um, students are, are experiencing um, housing instability and food instability as they, as they get here and try to um, adjust to life. Um, also, it's a moment of recognizing as teachers, and I don't know if there are other educators in the room, that um, students often work jobs after school. So, um, it's sort of like a constant reminder to myself and my colleagues that um, homework isn't always a, a reality because students often leave school and go work for eight or 10 hour shifts and come to school really tired the next morning. Um, so it's keeping those sorts of complications in mind. Um, in addition, um, a lot of students who are queer or having um, sort of questioning their gender or coming into um, new language around their own gender identities. I think given what's going on in Florida and Texas and across the country um, in terms of uh, regulations against um, trans students and trans student athletes, um, it's sort of a scary time to be, to be a gender non-conforming person, especially if you're a student who's a person of color and you're gender non-conforming. Um, so as, a, as an educator, what I'm really trying to do is encourage students to not only talk to me about it, but to join clubs and um, talk to other students and mentors who um, can be there for them. Um, I also know I mentioned um, books earlier, but um, for lack of sounding corny for the second time during this panel, um, to go to the library, um, to go to the school library or a local library, especially if folks are in, in New York City, um, not only are there physical books, but um, especially the New York City Public Library has an app called Libby where you can listen to audiobooks for free in their huge collection. And that has been not only a game changer for my personal reading life, more Brooklyn, um, but also a game changer for a lot of my students. Um, one of the really amazing things that came out of COVID um, was, or at least the COVID time era, is that so many more of my students are readers now. Um, they might be reading uh, manga or comics or sort of like trashy novels, but if they have their eyes or their ears on a page, 
um, then I'm really excited for them. And those have been really amazing points of connection for me and students, but also points of connection for their own identities that they can then read about or listen about. Um, yeah, so those are some of some of my thoughts on that question. I just want to shout out, I'm uh, sorry, uh, Trace, when you're talking about the libraries, that is, I'm down in Maryland and the, go to the library, your local library. We went, I went for just to um, do an activity and the librarian was just phenomenal with wanting to spend time and providing resources and information and gave us a tour. And I mean, it's just unbelievable that and it's very similar in Maryland. Um, you know, from the newspaper to, I mean, there's so many things that you have access to. So just a wonderful, and I think it's also a safe space for some of, at least our life, the one down here in Maryland, it just seems to be a safe space, welcoming of all persons coming in the door. Um, so shout out to our library. And just quickly, just to um, help, help parents and caregivers just understand what stages psychosocially um, their kid may be, be at. So usually we, we identify, there, there are various different um, psychological ways to interpret it, but one way that I, um, the, the, the lens that I approach is um, through one of uh, a previous psychologist named, um, it's, it's Eric, Eric Somian. Um, so, through like 19, 11 to um, 19, this is a crucial stage for identity, right? Um, and if there is a crisis, it can be in a stage where there is confusion of roles. So um, it's very crucial for um, what their peers are saying. It's more important, it matters. And um, what's on social, social media, uh, they'll likely grab that before um, taking advice from, from their parents. Um, so just understanding that um, there will be that sway in the direction to what their peers are saying and what their environment is bidding um, is, is important. And, you know, once we get into our 20s and it goes all the way to 45, now love is actually important. So intimacy, right? And we, we take that for granted. Um, intimacy is not only sexual, but spiritual, emotional, um, self-intimacy. And I think it's important to try to um, probe um, with curiosity, um, with, with your young adults, with your kids, and just what their definitions of intimacy are, what are their conflicts with intimacy, and how can they get to a space where they're not isolated, right? Where they have that, that community, where they have um, comfort with um, attachment um, that can give them, you know, more more gusto to to walk and navigate um, their their environment. So just keeping that in mind, just understanding that psychosocially there are different stages of life that we're all experiencing, um, and the the movement from identity and how that can, if that's not resolved, it can be in a space where there is um, identity confusion. Um, and that leads into in intimacy, where if that's not resolved, there can be um, some conflicts and struggles where the individual may feel isolated and not know how to um, ask for support and have a sense of community. Thank you so much for that. I wish that someone started those conversations with me when I was a young person. Uh, it's really uh, valuable to, to really think about kind of identity, intimacy, and, and how that all um, affects our sense of safety. So thank you. We did get a few questions that came in to the chat um, directly. So I'm gonna go ahead and ask, I think one or two of those, depending on our timing, and then we'll go ahead and wrap up. Um, before that, uh, Justin, is it possible to pull up the poll results? You might already have it. Y'all can see something different than I can. Awesome. So I'm going to show this and read this out loud, just so as we are kind of going through this, this last question, folks, uh, the panelists can keep this in mind. What types of mental health resources do you find most personally valuable? And we got a lot of folks here saying personal stories, uh, which is really awesome um, and something that um, you should definitely check out our youth healing space for, both our family corner and our youth healing space uh, on the Stephon site. 
share a lot of personal stories and it's something that we want to continue to build. So I really love hearing that. Um, also we're seeing next social media and then body video, audio resources and guides. Um, I know that we definitely have some, um, video and audio guides. I think a few were already dropped in the chat earlier, but we'll send those out too. And finally, if you don't already follow us on social media, I really recommend you follow the Steve fund. Um, especially on Instagram, because we're constantly posting tips um, and events and resource guides. So if you're someone who is very much on social media and rely on it for information, I highly recommend you follow us um, so that you can learn more. All right. For our Last question, I'm looking at time. I'm gonna go ahead and call it. For our last question, I'd love to hear folks talk a little bit about peer pressure. Um, you know, we haven't really mentioned that, but there can be so much pressure to conform um, and, you know, what, what the pressure looks like can be changing as our days are changing, as our lives are changing. What, youth are being pressured to do can change, can be things that, you know, as caregivers, we don't even fully understand yet. Um, so talk to me a little bit about, you know, how caregivers can support their young, you know, student of color, youth of color in navigating, and I would say actually in identifying peer pressure and then navigating it. Well, if I could start, I would say to validate it, to not minimize it, as Dr. A was saying. I mean, developmentally, this is a time when they are going to be wanting to kind of gather together with their friends and kind of listen to their friends, where they're going to listen to you, listen to their friends more than you. And so that is going to be the guiding part of it in their ear. But as a peer, parent or caregiver or someone who loves and supports, to validate that, you know, to be the person that you are just there to sometimes listen to, you know, parent, caregiver, older person, let's not judge. Sometimes we'll hear things and be like, that's the craziest thing I've ever heard. And then shut down the conversation. But sometimes to bite that tongue and just listen. Um, I think it's so important sometimes to listen and not to judge. The other part I will say, and then I'll make space, for, um, provide opportunity or not, make space for my other colleagues, um, is to also, I say, reach into other members of your community. You hear me talk about this all the time. So if you're the primary caregiver, reach out to somebody, another auntie or a friend or somebody say, hey, take Nikki out because uh, can you reach out to her and just check in on her from time to time? So that way your child, your, your student isn't hearing the same thing from the same person, but there's other members of the community um, that can kind of tap into that peer pressure piece. So they have another safe space to land, another safe, trusted adult to land and kind of tease out some of the things that other youth have to say that can be a little bit different than we would think as adults we would hear. Just, just quickly, thank you, Dr. Pondexter. Um, yes, the listening, you know, being a, an active, empathetic list, listener is, is super um, important. And um, not to take for granted how you can still pose to be, if not a mentor to your own child, to mentor to other children or young adults in the community by how you carry yourself. You know, peer pressure does not have an age limit. We experience it in the workplace, right? We experience it as um, um, adults or even in, you know, proxy of um, being a parent and seeing, oh, is this parent doing a better job than me? There's always going to be a pressure. So um, definitely acknowledging it and providing that space to, to validate it. And if you think it's just, you know, maybe too much and that your child may not feel comfortable talking to you about, you know, what stressors they're experiencing, definitely um, giving them um, direction of how they can employ uh, mentors in their community, uh, professors, teachers, um, older siblings, um, there's so many other people um, besides you um, that can you know, provide that support. It takes a village indeed. Um, communication um, works with community and, and collaboration. So um, definitely don't worry alone. There's, there is fruitfulness in team work and team playing. And um, I think just 
giving that back to your, your kid and letting them know and not having that stress. Oh gosh, I have to talk to my parent about it. Oh no, I don't want to. Giving them that relief to let them know that there are other resources that they can um, express how they're actually feeling and their experiences. I love that so much. And I actually want to um, kind of uh, highlight something that I know I spoke with the panelists about, um, you know, out, outside of uh, our conversation today, which is the role of mentors or mentorship. I know that came up in all of our conversations. And, you know, I think one big takeaway from this conversation for me, at least, is that any time that I am in a young person's life, I have an opportunity to be their a, a mentor to them in some way. And, you know, depending on my relationship with that person, I might have a responsibility really to be a mentor, right? And, and that doesn't mean you have to be a primary caregiver or even, you know, a teacher or anything like that but knowing that you can be an influence and a reliable adult for that young person, maybe they're not wanting to talk to their parents, as you mentioned, about um, the pressures that they're experiencing at school, but they might be willing to talk to someone else. And so if you, you know, I think a lot of the tools that we're, we're discussing today are tools that we can use to open up conversations with um, youth of color who are in our lives, uh, but maybe are not our day-to-day -day, uh, responsibility. And I think that's that's something that really uh, resonates for me and I wanted to highlight. I am looking at the clock and I know we are coming up on time. So I would love to wrap us up. Um, first of all, I wanna thank all of you for joining us here at the Steve Fund. Your presence and participation is really an important part of our bigger push to build community tools and interdependence so that youth of color can thrive. And we talked about a lot today. So we will be sending out, as I mentioned, a follow-up email with the resources that our panelists referenced, as well as a link to today's recording. If you haven't already, I shouted out before, um, please follow us at the Steve Fund on social media and check out our youth healing space at stevefund.org slash youth healing space and also our family corner at stevefund.org slash family corner for additional resources and supports. I also want to acknowledge that we're gonna be sharing a follow-up survey in the chat and via email. So please look out for that link in the chat momentarily. And we really appreciate your feedback. Please, we are doing this so that we can, again, support youth of color so that they can thrive. If you have ideas or feedback for how we can better support you in doing that, please let us know. And finally, I want to thank our amazing, amazing panelists today. Dr. Ayodola Adigan, Dr. Nikki Poindexter Ham, and our amazing teacher Trace Sanchez Roth for joining us on their very, very busy first week of school. A big shout out as well to our Steve Funds family support team for making this happen. Thank you, Justin. Thank you, Rachel, for posting and navigating the chat and doing all of the tech logistics. Um, with that, I want to wish you a wonderful evening and we look forward to seeing you soon.